All right. So, happy Saturday. I wanted to do a quick video on some stuff I've been working on or thinking about and uh, reading about. And that way, you don't have to do the same thinking and reading. That's the plan. And I want to say one of the things I got this week was the Max Meets book. I don't know if you can see it. No Shortcuts. Why States Struggle to Develop a Military Cyber Force. And I don't know. I honestly don't know why they struggle so hard. Stop making everything look so hard, I guess, is possibly not what the book is about. Anyway, let's talk about it. Who is vulnerable? Um, and this, this very, this very cozy looking bear has, has, has a lot of questions about that. So let's go into those questions. Uh, I was reading a paper last week, um, subversion versus coercion versus a hole in the ground. Um, you know, I had a couple international relationship concepts that I wanted to talk about. So, you know, because these videos are often you know, the biggest audience is international relations students who are doing cyber studies. Um, so I had a couple concepts that I wanted to go over, but if you want to look at the paper, this is the paper. Um, I'm not doing a paper review in this particular talk because um, it requires, honestly, a lot of work to do a, a paper review. I wanted to talk about a bunch of other things first, um, but we are going to go into the paper a bit because I think it highlights an interesting aspect of international relations studies. So um, let's talk about the under theories, theorized instrument of power, subversion. Um, and I, I think it's worth just reading some of this uh, in the abstract, uh, looking at the 2016 US presidential election and the strategic surprise that it, it generated. Uh, I don't think it's crazy to say that Donald Trump won in part for a lot of different things, but in part because of a Russian sponsored influence campaign that was effective. Um, I think you can not want to believe it or want to believe it, but some of the, you know, every variable matters when uh, your elections are this close. And if uh, you can put your thumb on the, on the scale, even a little bit, sometimes that can make strategic differences. So we say um, the, the integrate the intelligence scholarship and international relations theory we're going to talk about in a bigger way in this particular talk um, but looking at the abstract traditional subversion targets social structures whereas cyber operations target socio-technological structures namely information technology embedded in modern societies so that's that's kind of the summation of part of the thesis of this paper um, and then, you know, cyber operations are a means of subversion. Um, you know, what is the theory's utility, right? Like the, this new theory that is in this paper, what is the theory's utility by examining a case study, right? So that's a very normal structure for an international relations paper. Um, so let's, we're going to ask, one of the questions you already have in your head is, is a cyber operation a means of subversion right so and and before that i really want to talk about what what does it mean to use a theory especially when you look at international relations so why are you studying international relations this is something we've talked about in a previous talk but in general theories are either useful for describing and then when they get better they're useful for predicting and then when they get better they're useful for manipulating the world right like that's all theories and all science and in the sense that if you get away from this, you run the risk of, um, you know, staring into your belly button lint, right? So you start arguing about semantics. What is coercion? What does it really mean? A good theory in this space can be translated into Google Translate and then translated back without losing the underlying utility, right? So it shouldn't matter about what particular words you use. Like it shouldn't you should be able to discuss it equally in Chinese or equally in Russian without having to argue, like, what does this word really mean, right? So when you start in that, if you start feeling like you're talking about Scientology, you have left the realm of utility, right? So you're doing international relations still, but in the worst sense of academics, right? So that's the, 
the trap that so much of these sort of papers have fallen into. So that is something that you have to have in your mind at all times when you're reading one of these papers. Am I building a theory that can describe, predict, and manipulate the world? Or am I, and I don't know, whatever you want to call the other thing, right? So um, be very careful that you don't go down this path. Um, and and if you, you know, people are like, well, I mean, that's, you know, a lot about understanding the different parts, right? Like the value of understanding realism or constructivism in international relations is not to build its own mental structure for the purpose of having a mental structure. It is to, def you know, def like describe, predict, and manipulate the real world, right? So that is something that I think has been really lost in a lot, especially in the cyber world, right? So, be, uh, you know, you will see people in cyber policy who have built a humongous mental tower and are now arguing about what sort of imaginary decorations they can put on the very top of the tower. And there's no point in interacting with that, right? So that's not why you're watching this video, because we're not going to be in that world, okay? So, um... Realist, highest goal, right? Basic, like, Stratford-level geopolitics, right? Like, it doesn't matter who's president. It only matters what the country, you know, is connected to. Oh, you got two oceans on each side. You're one kind of country. You got, you know, land. You're landlocked. You're another kind of country. Um, oh, wait. But there's people in these countries, right? Countries are made up. Yeah. And, again, I, like, they, when you read this stuff, they will talk about how it's sort of like, you know, the end of the Cold War sort of awakened an idea that, like, maybe there's some more stuff going on here. But um, obviously, you know, if you look at how countries evolved and how groups of people moved around the world, you have to take into consideration, you know, religion and a bunch of other different, you know, ac you know giant companies, uh, a bunch of other things that were not states, right? So um, st it's, it's not really a new theory, right? So in the sense that, like, these are very weird abstract realism is a very weird abstraction what they're trying to decide determine is the dominant behavior of a system so that we can then predict the system right so if what they're saying is the state is now the dominant behavior that may have been a blip right that may have been just a little moment of time uh and now maybe something else the you know giant interstate corporations are the dominant behavior of the system perhaps so anyway I would just say, be cautious of getting trapped in these sort of thought prisons as you're doing it. And I think one of the great books I read recently was this book. And it is, I would, I would call it a constructivist book in the sense that it talks about a lot of socio-technological structures relating to China, but also about sort of the history and where all these things are. It's a really good book, very readable, I would say. Um, and... Uh, it's good to see, like, it's like a, it's like a, you know, 200 page case example, right? So, um, many of you have already read it probably. Anyway, so that's, that's the first step here. And I would also say, just like you're looking at with machine learning, every layer of abstraction in your theories has a cost, a huge cost, right? Like in terms of computation, but also in terms of accuracy. So, the fact that something is, for example, subversion or is not subversion, just think of that as like another layer in the structure. And if you build all these layers up and the layer, there's too many layers, you're never going to be able to produce accurate, fast predictions. So that is a real issue with some of the existing literature in international relations. So they've built, you know, many, many, many layers of abstraction, but the accuracy by the time they get to the top is nil. Right? So that's a risk. So you need to be able to measure that. Right? If you haven't measured in your larger theor theoretical structure, oh man, now we're talking about like, we got six citations deep and the first person was definitely not talking about what we're talking about now. Like that's an issue that you're going to see in a lot of these papers. So be careful. Okay. Um, let's talk about this paper. Was manipulation of the 2016 election by the Russians subversive? Uh, did it reverse structural power? Did it turn benefits into harm? Did it secretly manipulate vulnerabilities in structures? This very fancy bear wants to know, right? He has, he has questions. 
In other words, what is cyber power and what is cyber war? Right? Like these are the larger questions that this this paper and these questions fit into. Um, and let's talk a little bit about hacking and structural power in general, right? So this that's what this paper is going into. Um, so uh, building on some work, we define structural power as the capability to shape structures of interaction and determine the capacities of structural positions. It's a little bit tautological. Uh, let's see what he says next. Subversion reverses this power. I argue by turning the capacities of structural positions into sources of harm. It does so by secretly exploiting vulnerabilities in structures of interaction to manipulate them and produce outcomes that were neither expected nor intended by holders of structural power, as well as agents interacting within a structure to the advantage of the subverter. Huh. Well, uh, I don't know about that, right? So that these are all questions that, that we're going to ask, right? So um, if you're thinking about this work, you have to think deeply about what does it mean to have structural power in the modern age. Um, hacking is subversion. So that's the second question. So first question is structural power, if it's subverted, can have effect. Um, hacking is subversion is the second part of your logical structure. Um, and just as an aside, you have to read papers without... Uh, getting them spoon-fed to you in the sense that most papers do not have very clear logical structures in this space. So, um, or in any space, let's be honest. Uh, it's very rare. There's, there's some people who have very clear logical minds and they write those minds into their papers. But most of these papers don't. It's a lot of work to produce very clear logical structures. Uh, most people don't put together a flowchart of their logic before they write the paper or even after they write the paper. And you generally have to reverse engineer that logic um, as you're reading the paper. And I recommend you create a flowchart when you're reading one of these papers. Um, okay, so uh, that doesn't mean the papers are bad. It just means that they're not all written by <laughs> machines, shall we say. Um, okay, so hacking is the exploitation of techn technical or social vulnerabilities to gain unauthorized access in order to manipulate them, right? So um, it's not the only one, but then... Because ICTs are embedded in society, you get some socio-technological structures uh, constituted from a five-layered set of shared rules, practice, and understandings. Okay, let me. One of the weaknesses of this particular paper and a lot of other papers is they draw arbitrary boundaries. I would call it like a bug class, drawing arbitrary boundaries. Um, there's five. Uh, people love numbers, right? They're, and they love small numbers. Like if I was to tell you, there's eleven. Uh, an 11 layered set of shared rules, practices, and understandings, and then I made up like 11 of them, you'd say, oh, that's too many. That can't possibly be right. But if I tell you, oh, there's three of them, you're like, okay, that sounds right. Right? Like, this is a trap, right? Like, it, there's not five of them and there's not three of them. There's no set number of them, right? All of these things are in floating point. They're not integers. So the choice of where to draw the boundaries can really manipulate your argument. And I think this particular paper and the previous paper on the trilemma are really good examples of that. There's no trilemma, right? Like, that's crazy, right? Like, there's there's a set of, there's, like, a bunch of things that go, a bunch of variables, right? Like, everyone wants to d define things into, like, three variables because three is, like, something humans like or something. I don't know. It I guess it depends on what kind of human you are, how neurodiverse you are, whether or not the number three calls to you or the number five, right? Um, so uh, through cyber operations, state A thus secretly subverts ICTs to produce effects, influence, sabotage, or economic warfare. Okay, so I love this part of the paper in the sense that I love the idea of looking at hacking and complex socio-technological structures um, and then, you know, trying to figure out how that manipulation works. I think it's a little premature to stand on some of this, though. Um, the subversive nature of cyber operations. Um, so this is a continuation. 
cyber operations are instruments of socio-technological subversion that reverse structural power. And I think what you should put mentally at, at the end of this sentence is sometimes, right? Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Um, they exploit ICTs and the way they are used in societies, going after different targets. But as I will illustrate below, using the same means as technical subversion. That's maybe. Uh, it's an assertion for now. A key mechanism of exploitation is hacking, which is simply a clever way of getting the computer to do what you want it to do, even if the currently running program was designed to prevent that action. It does so by exploiting the vulnerabilities, which can be both technological and social. Technological vulnerabilities refer to flaws in the design of computer systems, and specifically to flaws in the logic of programming and code that determines what the machine does. Computer programs are constituted of code, um, sort of. Um, social vulnerabilities involve path pathologies in the behavior of human users of these systems, and exploiting such flaws is called social engineering. Um, hacking does not involve force, but rather creativity and cunning. There's a little bit of a fetishism of what hacking is in this paragraph. Uh, crucial gaps and openings for actions to work against the system from within. It's a little fetishistic is kind of where I'd put that paragraph. Um, okay, so the ICTs that are increasingly embedded in modern societies are constitutive elements of a structure of interaction forming complex socio-technological systems. I, I like this, um, and if you're really interested in some of this stuff, I believe that Clay Shirky's book, Here Comes Everybody, is a really good stepping point for a lot of these concepts. It's a very old book, actually. Um, and you never see him cited, but it's much better than a lot of this other stuff. Uh, the core idea is that the social and technological are not separate independent variables, but interlinked. Um, okay, so I really like this starting point uh, quite a lot. Um, I think it's it, it allows you to think about these things in a little bit more flexible way. Um, so these shared understanding rules and practices contain different vulnerabilities that subversive agents can exploit to reverse the benefits of computerization into harms. The first two layers are constitutive. And this is kind of where we start talking, we start getting into like how valuable are the definitions that you're putting in your paper, right? So like, um, you know, we're gonna talk about constitutive versus, you know, some other type of layer. Um, okay, this, this part here. Just like spies can infiltrate social interactions and secretly turn them into agents of the subverter, computer viruses or malware can infiltrate target systems and secretly turn them into agents of the sponsor of the cyber operation. Okay, so that actually is the opposite of the theory above, which is more abstract and I liked better, right? So um, if you are looking at the, the overall behavior of a, of a very complicated system, the emergent behavior of a socio-technological system, calling a particular piece of that an agent of another system and looking at that as a subver subversive like tool, I think is, is going backwards in a way. So um, recent literature suggests the term non-anthropocentric agents. I'm not even bothered to read that paper. No, <laughs> that's just silly. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about reverse structural power um, and cyber power. Again, I'm just uh, cutting and pasting out of the paper for you here so you don't have to. Um, what are the two unresolved issues in cybersecurity scholarship? I love it when people call it scholarship. Uh, first, the mechanism of reversing the benefits of structural position explains the capability vulnerability paradox. Okay, so the capability vulnerability paradox is, um, you're gonna, I'm sure we're gonna find out that, you know, sometimes the more capable you are, the more vulnerable you are, uh, which is what he's talking about here. The greater those benefits that you get from ICT, the greater the potential harms are. We're gonna talk, I guess we'll talk about them as a potential energy of harm. Maybe put some math on that one. Um, so, in other words, the more structural power a state holds, the greater the potential opportunities for subversive actors become. 
and that's subversive actors in general, not subversive actors, not hackers necessarily as a subversive actor. But what they're saying is that hacking attacks countries that get a lot of structural power from ICT, right? So if your entire economy is ICT related, then you are much more at risk, right? So um, then they're saying that uh, the challenges involved in subversion. So if we talk, if we look at subversion literature in general, we're going to find that um, there's a, there's limits to how far subversion can get you. Therefore, 30 years of warnings of cyber war, we haven't had any cyber war, right? So I don't know. You can make up within your mind how much you agree with that particular logical flow. Um, but this very, very um, amazing panda bear says the more central, the more vulnerable the subversion. Says it in Mandarin, though. Um, okay, so let's look at the subversion vulnerability thinking, right? And I, because th I think there's like something broken in the in the literature here, and I wanted to put it in pictures. Um, so here's the cyber subversion theory as presented in the paper, right? You got North Korea on one end, which is kind of like using like building your physical model off a black hole, right? Like if your physics incorporates starts with black holes, then things get really complicated very quickly, right? So um, North Korea, no computers, not very vulnerable. I didn't say zero because there's like some reports of vulnerability, so we're not going to say zero, but we'll say not very vulnerable, right? And then United States. And you can argue about the slope of that line. Maybe that slope is super high. Maybe it's super low. You can argue about that. So pretty vulnerable, right? So you're like, cool. Um, so that's that's like the linear the linear version, as presented pretty much in, the, in most of the papers that you'll read about subversion theory. Um, and then you get like thresholded, right? So this is something I haven't really seen in any of the papers, but you could definitely in your little head imagine it, right? Where you have like North Korea and then you like pass a certain level of socio-technological integration. Everybody's pretty vulnerable, right? So um, and maybe that's a little wavy line. Maybe it's a slightly different slope. Maybe it's flat. Maybe So that's, that's pretty good. I don't know. Um, and then you get like what I like to call the maturity model, cyber subversion theory, where you have like, North Korea on one end, not very vulnerable, and there's a big curve as you go up, and then you start have building a maturity model into it. That means you have two variables, and then that's how you get curves. And <laughs> you get a United States at the end, and maybe the United States not as vulnerable as you expected. Maybe it's still vulnerable, but not as vulnerable, right? So and you put Iran on here, you put China on here. Um, maybe China is the most vulnerable, right? So, um, or maybe it's closer to the United States, or maybe it's closer to North Korea. I don't know. You can decide where to put it on this line. Um, but like when we look at Iran, we're not going to say it's not vulnerable because we have these amazing pictures from the uh, Predatory Sparrow team, right? So before cyber attack, after cyber attack, you know, one of them's on fire. So it's not that they're not vulnerable, right? So um, the reality of this is that it's wrong in a very interesting way. And with international relations papers, there's wrong in a boring way and which is usually when they're just messing with words. And then there's wrong in an interesting way, which is when the concepts are interesting, but at a weird abstraction or, or otherwise um, maybe not detailed enough. And I think that's the case here when you look at like subversion stuff with cyber, right? So everybody has a different set of weaknesses. And that's true for people, computers, countries. I may be very vulnerable to... Um, romantic comedies, but horror movies just don't bug me or even interest me, right? So we all have different vulnerabilities, um, and and that curve is a multi-dimensional curve that you know is dependent on a lot of different factors. So, and I think that's really what it comes down to. So, when you have elections, you're vulnerable to election manipulation. If you don't have elections, maybe you're not. But what if you have really well managed elections? Then you're also not, right? So that's this stuff gets becomes very complex, and that's what makes, I think, the utility of cyber subversion theory much more difficult to get in the real world. So when you actually use it to start to define and predict and manipulate the world, you may run into issues because the real world is so much more complex.
So, um, and I wanted to talk about a few of these in detail, right? Like, what do those complexities look like in detail? And in particular, if you look at a lot of countries, they use a ton of pirated and out-of-date software. So, um, you know, uh, most companies have out-of-date software, pirated software. That's, that's not confusing. But for some countries, that's all they have, right? So everything is out-of-date. Everything is pirated. Um, that makes it really, like, so your supply chain issues get nightmarish. Your, you know, patching is a nightmare. Um, all that stuff. So that's that can be an issue, a, a vulnerability sort of issue. If you don't have a trained cadre of incident responders, that's another problem, right? Do you have, who is your national champion antivirus company? Do you have more than one? What is your capacity there? Um, if you don't have native software engineering teams, it's very hard to do a lot of different things. Um, so in this sense, I would say that India is less vulnerable than a country that, that doesn't have native software engineering teams, simply because they have so much of that capacity laying around. Um, and then gathering lots of data on your citizens and storing it all over the place makes you more vulnerable, right? So that's the same issue that surveillance capitalism has and also authoritarianism, right? If you had to translate both of them into what they actually do, you would say they gather lots of data on their citizens and they store it all over the place, right? So that makes you more vulnerable. And again, if you have like a static and unchanging ICT, so if you are in the type of business that has sort of like you install it and you can't turn it off and that is your sort of native business, then that is more vulnerable. And that's why you see, you know, factories are more vulnerable. And if you're a country that relies on factories, you're more vulnerable than one that relies on banking, for example. So um, what I want to point out is that some of the things the information security community tells you uh, are truisms and they're also kind of wrong. Right, and so if you live in a world of information of, of international relations, then you will just take them at face value, even though security people don't take them at face value. Right, so we will say complexity is the opposite of security. Right, and we mean a lot of different things by that. Right, so, but in reality, we know complexity is not the opposite of security. It is another variable, and it does affect security. Right, so and it can affect it both in good and bad ways. Right, so. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into this, uh, but a more complicated socio-technological system does not necessarily mean a more vulnerable one to subversion. A lot of that complexity is, in fact, security, right? That's the, the security boundaries you're setting up. Uh, it's like having multiple cells in your organism. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about force structure based on that. So I feel like for a lot of international relations and even a lot of just cyber policy people, they've kind of got this mental model of security as basically a, uh, a sludge of amoebas, essentially. And they don't want to talk about structure. And you need to start getting to the point, and I assume that's in this book, where you talk about force structure. What is the force structure? How do you maintain your force structure? Because if I'm overloaded with infantry and I have no armor, then that's bad. But vice versa is also really bad, right? Like each of the people in on this little team has a different role and they are not replaceable by just another version of one of the other people, right? So that's super important. And if you're going to be reading papers like this that kind of conglomerate it all, or even if you're just reading government policies, you'll often say, they'll be like, we have 50,000 open positions. And I would say you don't have 50,000 open positions for cyber. You have 10,000 positions open for, for incident responders, and then another 10,000 for vulnerability researchers, and then another 10,000 for security engineers, and then another 10,000 for something else, for managers. Most people forget that managers exist, right? As if you can have just lymph nodes and no central nervous system, and no connective tissue, right? Like, so um, these things are not, like, you need to get to this point where you are looking at the biology of your, of your cyber operations and trying to analyze that biology understanding that cells are differentiated, that they're not all the same. Um, and I wanted to put together 
just a simple metric to predict government cyber power, which is the amount of just hate, the amount of antipathy that your government has for hackers. And I don't mean like nice hackers, like security engineers or like, I mean the ones that have very little social skills, right? Like the, the people who in general are extremely annoying because they find that staring at a bunch of hexadecimal numbers all day is a lot more fun than dealing with other people. Like those people, if your government hates them, which most governments do, then your cyber power is pretty restricted. It's pretty restricted no matter how much money you pour into it. And when people talk about manipulation of the world, usually they're talking about where to put money. Um, you can analyze a good force structure in cyber punches well above its weight. Understanding and being able to predict that and being able to manipulate it in real time is a huge benefit to your team, whatever your team happens to be. If, uh, if you're playing a video game and your team has healers and the other team doesn't have any healers, you're going to win even if they have more players. Does that make sense? I try to put it into these, uh, you know, that's a Gen Z concept there. Um, so that's the end of this talk, right? Like I wanted, I didn't want to go over the paper in depth, but I want to talk about the, the, the principles behind analyzing this kind of paper in, in depth and point at where you should be looking to go. Because as you read these papers, I don't want you to absorb them. I want you to challenge them and figure out where they fit in your mental models of how you can get the job done that you need done. Uh, since, you know, most of the people sort of in the class that these videos are used in are, are going into government. So anyway, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my amazing, amazing pictures. Um, and I do recommend reading the paper. I also recommend reading the book. Again, you can read it boop, by Max Meets. Um, you can beat me to it. I'll probably do another video analyzing it. But who is vulnerable and how? I still think it's an unanswered question. Subversion? Is cyber hacking subversion? I don't think so. But maybe you do after reading the paper. Anyway, thank you so much for listening.